So let's talk about the different treatment options kind of for, as an example, okay? We'll get to that Socratic question in a second. Okay. If, I, um, if I had a student, a, a kid who I was working with, who showed a high perseverative interest to um, Pokemon, right? Let's just pick Pokemon. I'm sure somebody here's kid that they work with or they know just highly focused on Pokemon. Like everything has to be Pokemon, right? And it's leading to a little bit of problems for them because they're not motivated to learn unless it's Pokemon. And they're not motivated really for social engagement unless you're talking about Pokemon. And it's impacting their ability to make friends because you know what, sometimes kids don't want to talk about Pokemon, right? So it's not totally problematic, but there are these issues. So how would you go about treating that? How would you go about planning to help that child? N nobody's gonna say you have to get rid of Pokemon, right? So what, what are you gonna do in this sense? Great, so one thing we can do is schedule Pokemon time, right? So you've got like, this is your, your private time. You can, for this, for this half hour, go crazy on Pokemon, right? Draw Pokemon, like this is your Pokemon time. And then you start to create separate contingencies where you start to say, okay, these other times are non-Pokemon times. And you can create a behavioral contract if you wanted to for it, a positive one, not one that has like a lot of penalizing elements, right? But a, a positive one that promotes and reinforces. And the, the challenge there, of course, is finding the right motivators, right, for that non-Pokemon time. Uh, but maybe you can relate that to more Pokemon cards, right? Some, you can play around with that. Something else you could probably do is look to expand the, the realm of focus, right? You can shape from starting with Pokemon, right, to a broader set of card sets. You could look to see beyond. You could uh, kind of create, a, a reinforce a broader set of uh, fo foci, for example, right? These are behavioral, common behavioral strategies. You could also find particular Pokemon groups that, they, that the child may create, find an adaptive component to it where you find not only Pokemon time that's potentially isolating still, but a way that it actually helps them continue to build their social, develop, their social skills, develop social confidence, and so on, right? So if a child now um, couldn't stop thinking about Pokemon, and this was super distressing for them, they didn't want to think about Pokemon. In fact, they're scared of Pokemon, right? Because they're worried that the Pokemon is going to jump out of the screen and eat them. Right? And they, they, it's never happened, but they're very scared. They don't like it, it's shocking to them, it scares them, but they can't help but Google Pokemon. Right? And they can't help but ask other kids about their Pokemon. And, and you know, that's all they talk about. So they obsess about Pokemon, they're really stuck on this. Right? And anytime they, they feel anxious about Pokemon, they have to check to see if Pokemon is around. They have to ask anybody, are there Pokemon cards here? Right? Is Pokemon on the, going to be on the TV channel? They refuse to look at, do Netflix because there might be a Pokemon that pops up right? on the Netflix. Right? So they, they, they only Google certain things and they'll only watch that. Right? And if Pokemon does pop off, they turn off the TV right away and they leave the room. How would you go about helping that child? So some, thank you, so some degree of exposure with response prevention in a systematic way, right? And we can talk tomorrow about how do you adapt CBT to do that depending on developmental levels. But there are two different treatment strategies. Both involve obsessions, both involve, could involve compulsions, both could be impairing socially, okay? But our thinking about how we wanna treat them might differ considerably. Now that's an extreme case. And there are other cases where our treatment options might look very similar, they might be the same thing. But that's why I'm spending so much time today trying to explain these ideas. Because what we choose to do will differ depending on how we conceptualize it. So is anxiety good or bad? What do you think? Who says anxiety is good? Raise your hand. And who says anxiety is bad? Raise your hand. And there's like, almost, most people did not raise their hands at all, <laughs> right? You refuse, like I refuse to engage in this Socratic dialogue. So you're right, because it's, 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 it's neither good nor bad. Anxiety is, right? Anxiety is. And what is anxiety? Anxiety is a message about something we value. You only really feel anxious about something you value. Think, think about yourself. Think about the last time you felt anxious. I'm pretty darn sure there was a threat to something that you value, a perceived threat. People who are anxious about 
develop anxiety disorders around panic, it's because they value their health. They value their well-being, right? People who are anxious in social situations and develop social anxiety, it's because they value the appraisal of others. People who are, is it just about anxiety? No. People who are angry, right, because somebody disrespected them, value themselves and value social norms, as an example, right? So these kind of negative affectivity, more broadly one can argue, involves challenges to things that we value. Think about that as we conceptualize anxiety and autism and ask yourself as you're going around trying to learn from your, from your, from your students or learn from your clients and they're telling you these stories, ask yourself, what does this tell me about something that you value? And that presents as your first inroad, which might be a very idiosyncratic inroad into that child's kind of problem. Right? It gives you the perfect opportunity to establish a therapeutic rapport with them because that's something you could probably answer after you learn about a child and it, it helps to resonate. It helps somebody to feel heard because you get this is what, this is important to them. And that's what anxiety is saying, right? Anxiety is saying X is important, right? Even if they can never articulate that to you, okay? So that being my, just keep that in mind as we go. So anxiety, you know, Temple Grandin talked about what anxiety feels like for her. And many of the feelings of anxiety could be the same feelings of anxiety that you and I have, that anybody without autism has. Right? It might not manifest differently, per se, in our experience. Um, there can also be, you know, with, with she talked about physical, a lot of physical symptomatology around autism, uh, anxiety. So sometimes people have anxiety that's more cognitively kind of based, let's say, so worry. Right, which is really not a feeling. If anybody, let's, let's take away that myth right now, right? Worry, we don't, we don't feel worried. We have worried thoughts. And we, feel, we feel the anxiety. We feel the emotion associated with that worry. But um, we can have kind of cognitive pieces of, of manifestations of anxiety, which is worry. We can have physiological sensations associated with it. We can have both, right? As well as the emotion itself. There might be particular idiosyncratic expressions of anxiety and autism, things that are quite unique. You know, uh, the specific phobias, you know, there are five classes of specific phobias that they're on one of your slides that are coming up, right? There's the common specific phobias, right? Um, and those might be the same ones that somebody with autism develops. They also might develop ones to things that are kind of unexpected, phobias, specific phobias of fire hydrants, right? Uh, specific phobias of the color red. Right? And, but they'll still meet the same criteria around a specific phobia. There's still the avoidance, there's still the same fear response elicited, and it's in a patterned and a very unique way to that stimuli. It's not generalized across stimuli. Right? So there might be a very, so you don't just get bound up in the same kind of manifestation. It has to look the same way as in without autism. Okay? Uh, so sometimes it will be really tricky to differentiate, is this autism or is it anxiety or is it both? They're going to be related, okay? It's not as e it's not, it's, even though I'm going to be talking, I'm going to talk about it as if they're totally separate, we know that it's not the case. So sometimes because of the clinical variability in autism already, it's going to be harder to pick up on anxiety separately. You know, tr traditionally when, when people think of is, is there anxiety, they're thinking about a child who doesn't have anxiety. Right? But more so, we need to think that most kids with autism are going to show some manifestation of anxiety in their lives, just in general, right, at some point in their past. So if, when you ask the question, have they, have they shown anxiety before this, the answer is often going to be yes, right? So it's not as kind of clear cut. Um, so be careful about missing some of those obvious things. I don't think people here are actually the ones that miss the obvious, uh, but you might have colleagues that miss the obvious. So send them to this workshop the next time. So the content of somebody's anxiety symptoms is highly tied to developmental level. I think it's very interesting that um, separation anxiety and specific phobias to animals, right, and uh, usually begin to manifest between six and nine years of, of, of age, right? Whereas generalized anxiety and phobias to danger and death to ex existential topics um, emerge, right, in this pre-adolescence, early adolescent stage. Whereas social anxiety is something that typically emerges kind of in the pre, you know, a little bit older. 
This is in the general population. But I think it's very important to think about this when you're thinking about what kind of manifestations of anxiety are coming out in the, the people you're working with. Think about their developmental level. Like where you think, not they, obviously somebody who is an adult and has the problem solving skill set of somebody much younger doesn't mean that from a biological perspective or from a maturity perspective, they are that age, right? It's not, it really is not the case. They're still adults. Um, but there can be commonalities with kind of their degree of maturity and their degree of problem solving around how anxiety manifests. So we would expect that those who are more severely affected demonstrate anxiety in ways that are very common around uh, these kind of more concrete phobias of attachment or, or um, animals, and then later these other more complex manifestations emerge. 